Thanks so much for everyone for coming to our talk for Dark Side of the Moon. So just really briefly, uh, we're with Lumen's Black Lotus Labs. I've been with the company for about two years now as a threat researcher, primarily focused on uh, crimeware type botnets. So um, basically your emotests, quack bots, trying to map out their architecture and trying to understand kind of who's behind them. My name's Crud. I work for Black Lotus Labs too. I'm a reverse engineer and I help lead up the crimeware side of the team. I've been there about five years. Awesome. So just kind of a little overview of kind of what we'll be talking about first. Um, just for anybody not familiar, we'll talk about Lumen and kind of Black Lotus Labs as a whole. Then we'll get into proxy services and how they're used or actually kind of rather abused, but we'll kind of move then over into the actual moon malware and kind of do a deep dive into how it works and kind of what we started noticing. Then we'll move into kind of the faceless infrastructure, so the actual proxy service, understand where users who are using the faceless service are coming from. And then we'll go into, we tried to um, disrupt the moon and faceless and tried to take the whole thing down and we'll talk about what happened, how did they respond and kind of what did we learn from that. So uh, for anybody who's not familiar with uh, Lumen, kind of the easiest way to understand uh, kind of what we do is when you think about um, how data gets transited across the internet, um, at some point, whether you're talking to somebody in a different state or a different country, at some point that data is going to go across some form of physical wire. And as you can see from the chart, those blue lines, um, we make up a large portion of kind of the internet backbone as a whole. So from that, we have a lot of ASNs and ISPs that peer with us and that we peer with. So we can see traffic from all over the world. And this helps us especially for um, threat hunting. We can see you know, IPs, ports, where people are talking to and metadata like that. So where Black Lotus Labs comes in is we're the threat research team for Lumen. So we primarily focus on our NetFlow data and hunting anything from crimeware botnets to APT groups to novel uh, activity that is unknown. So just so we can all kind of get on the same page, um, when we talk about botnets, um, botnets are just a group of devices that all kind of serve a common purpose. However, botnets can be broken down into sub botnets. So for example, you could have a botnet where one part of it's doing scanning, one part of it's doing espionage, one part of it's doing something completely unrelated, but they're all somehow connected. Um, obviously, botnets generally gathered through malware, some form of exploitation. And then they can be made up of multiple different device types. They can be gathered through phishing. They can be gathered through exploitation. Um, you name it. One of the interesting things to understand about botnets, though, is um, size doesn't always matter. It kind of matters um, what sort of botnet you're trying to make. So let's say you only have 10 bots, and you're trying to make a DDoS botnet. That's not going to work very well for you. You're going to need a lot more. But if you're, trying, if you're an APT group doing some form of espionage campaign, 10 bots may be perfect for you. So it all kind of depends on what your end goal is. So this kind of leads us to um, talking about proxy botnets. Or, uh, if you're actually going to try to sell it, maybe call it a service instead. Um, so proxy botnets excel at a few different things. One is having a large pool of devices um, kind of scattered all around the world. So if you think about proxying, um, let's say specifically for these criminal services, um, most of the time, let's say you have uh, credit card credentials and you're trying to use that somewhere, um, and let's say your credit card is based in Las Vegas, you'll need a proxy that's going to come out somewhere near Las Vegas. So if you have, if you make a proxy botnet but all the IPs are located, let's say, in Italy, well, that's great if your end users are trying to get to Italy, but if they're not, that's completely useless and won't be helpful. So you need your IPs very spread out. The next is you'll need a pool of infected devices to remain undetected. So this is, they can't be all blacklisted or nobody's going to want to use them. They'll never get past any endpoint detections. Um, another kind of crucial factor is who are you going to sell to? So if you make a proxy botnet, you kind of have two choices. One, you can sell to kind of end users like you or me. Maybe you sell by the IP, maybe you sell by bandwidth, or you can create a botnet and sell the entire thing to let's say an APT group or some form of group and just basically let them take it from there. Uh, the next important thing is no IP leaking, and this is actually in both directions. So obviously a proxy or a VPN, um, you obviously don't want your own IP leaked, but from the operator side, if they're leaking how, they how you can access the proxies, well, any user can basically figure that out and then resell their entire botnet almost for free. So they need to make sure the IPs are 
far disconnected from each other between where the actual proxy is and the end user. And the final is you'll need constant regular additions of new fresh IPs. So you can't control what your users are going to do with these IPs. So one of them might decide to just mass scan the internet over and over. That's going to get blacklisted really quickly and basically unusable. So you need to have a way to constantly be getting new IPs. So kind of to summarize it out, proxy services, they'll have really clear um, kind of terms and conditions of how your bandwidth is going to be used, how it's used, and you can opt in or out of it. Versus proxy botnets, you have no idea you're even infected. Your bandwidth's being used and you're none the wiser. Um, and as you can imagine, there's a ton of gray area in this. So actually really recently, um, there was a proxy botnet known as Cloud Router. And Cloud Router had got to about 200,000 to 250,000. And the government actually just took it down about two or three months ago. And the way Cloud Router gathered their bots was through a free VPN app and basically buried far deep within the terms of service. They basically said, hey, we're going to add you to a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, but nobody would have actually read that. Um, so nobody knew they were part of it. The government ended up taking them down and arresting the operator behind it. So in that case, for the free VPN app, clearly the government thought that fell in the category of malicious. So you can imagine there's tons of services that fall in this really weird gray area of are they truly malicious or are they actually a service? So this kind of gets us into the actual faceless proxy service. So there's a few uh, proxy botnets that are powered by malware. So you have things like Sox Escort, NSOX, and Faceless, I'd say, are the three biggest. Um, Faceless grew out of a service known as ISOX, which started in 2014. And that year will become important when we move kind of over to the moon. Um, it's always been advertised only in criminal forums. You'll never see it advertised um, by kind of benign users. And up until our publication, it was long speculated that it was primarily powered by malware, but nobody knew how or kind of where they were getting this from. So as you can see from the figure on the left, um, that's kind of a brief overview of just kind of the structure of how uh, Faceless looks from um, a bot perspective. And one of the really interesting parts to take from that is Faceless is located in 188 different countries. So at the beginning, we talked about you need a diverse pool of proxies. Um, they clearly have it. So you can basically go anywhere you want with the faceless service. On the right picture, you can see basically what will happen if you decide to buy an IP. An IP will range from you know, 50 cents to $2, depending on how brand new it is, if it's blacklisted, and things along those lines. So you'll basically have a way to use it. And then hopefully, um, the user won't be able to backtrack to actually figure out how to resell that. So when it comes to um, our Netflow data, we have a ton of data. And our goal is um, finding these type of botnets in the wild. So kind of how do we do that? Um, given our massive amount of Netflow data, we can see a lot of communication. So we can develop heuristics and different methods to basically try to figure out what's suspicious or what's kind of anomalous activity. So you can think of an easy example is, let's say you know yesterday, 10,000 routers based in the US all just started talking to a Russian IP. Well, that might not be malicious or even um, bad necessarily, but maybe it's something we want to look into a little more just to understand exactly kind of what's happening. And basically, this approach can be extrapolated to as far as your imagination can kind of go in terms of what you think is suspicious. This will kind of bring us down to a small population where then we can do some manual research to look for true positives. And this is actually how we kind of rediscovered the moon malware's reemergence. So the moon's been a proxy botnet um, that was first discovered back in 2014. And if you remember from the previous slide, ISOX is a proxy service that also started in 2014. Um, turns out that wasn't a coincidence. Um, Lumen uh, tried to disrupt this botnet in 2019. Um, and after that report, there was no real talk about what happened to um, the moon or anything. So nobody is really um, known kind of what it's been doing. But it's been in action for about five years since that. Um, so this time, we actually hopefully figured out exactly what it was doing all along. So then we found a sample that we believed was part of the facelets network. But after analyzing the sample, it turned out that it wasn't the C2 IPs that were embedded in it. Oh, sorry. Let me go back. <laughs> the first stage, the sample decrypted the, the second stage, which actually turned out to be the moon. And once it was decrypted, it would execute the binary and set up some firewall rules to block port 80 and 8080. 
probably to prevent other malware from infecting the device. So it also contained a list of three hard-coded C2s, and those C2s were not faceless infrastructure or known faceless infrastructure. Uh, it also, from reverse engineering, we saw that the malware attempted to contact the C2s on this port 15194, and then if nothing was returned, it would send another hard-coded packet to port 16194. And then the binary also had the ability to download and execute additional files. So we went ahead and ran it, and we got a response on the port 15194, and it returned some data and then what looks like a file name. And then after that file name would be requested, again, from the C2, along with another number. We're considering a version number. We're not exactly sure what it is. And then, so that would download and execute these SOX files. So what are SOX files? We don't know. Um, we see, received six different files. They were basically the same. There were two offsets that were different in the files. One was a hard-coded C2 and the other one was a replacement for those hard-coded C2s. So those, um, those, those C2s weren't active. None of the C2s that were in the SOX files were active. So allowing the malware to continue running, we get an additional file named SOXT. And this SOXT creates a binary file named .sox.twn. And this file contained a bunch of binary data that was read from the previous files and this data is the C2s and you can see here they're they're all the same. It's in this case it's 195.3.143.7.73 and this is a known faceless C2. So connecting to the faceless network, the SOX files will reach out to the C2, load it from the .sox.twn file on a random port between 4210 and 4217. Um, and then it would send a hard coded packet and this would just go on and on until eventually we received uh, another C2 that would be reached out to by the malware again. And this, <clears throat> then this C2, it would reach out on port um, 5010 to 5017, the same random port chosen by the previous, uh, previously. And then the, the new C2s, it was the same IP in this case will respond with a domain and a port the proxy to. And you can see that going on, going on in the PCAP next to it. And <clears throat> another file that we received was a .scz file. And this was set up the same as the main moon malware and decrypted and it would decrypt and execute this .scn file. Well, the .scn file was, would uh, attempt to spread by scanning IP block supplied by the C2 in search of exploitable web servers on ports 80 and 80, 80. And you can see that in the screenshot next to it where it's actually, that's the exploit that it would use to infect the um, IoT devices. Sure, so now from the malware aspect, we knew um, these two were related, but now we had to figure out just how much the relation was. So from the top left chart, um, that's days from when we saw a moon bot and then how long it took to actually communicate with a faceless C2. It actually, 80% of moon bots would communicate with a faceless C2 within two days. And keep in mind that we only see sample data and not all the traffic in the world, so that number is likely 100. And then the other part is the inverse relationship is true as well. So not only are most moon bots becoming faceless bots, but also almost every faceless C2 is around 80 to 90% made up of moon bots. So basically, the moon is the sole provider of bots for faceless, and faceless is solely taking bots from the moon. Um, they're kind of a hand-in-hand -hand relationship, or at least they were up until our action. <laughs> so the next interesting thing is faceless has a really interesting architecture. So from looking at a bot perspective, all the bots will communicate with the exact same moon C2. There's only one moon C2 in total, and all the bots will communicate with it. But uh, there's multiple different faceless C2s, and a bot will only communicate with one in its lifetime, and it has a very specific purpose. So for example, uh, all bots from a singular ASN 
communicate with one faceless C2. And this is basically all the devices in this ASN are basically old end of life devices. So clearly they found an exploit and took over basically the entire ASN. We have, um, if you remember the worm file that Steve talked about, that's basically anything that gets infected through that worm file is gonna communicate with another faceless C2. They set up one solely dedicated to ASUS bots. And what's interesting about the ASUS bots is that it doesn't appear that it's only end of life devices. So it's unclear if they have multiple different exploits or how exactly they're taking over so many different ASUS bots. We saw them take over over 10,000 within, I think it was 72 hours. So um, clearly they have a range of exploits for it. Another one is that they basically set up their own scanning infrastructure in that they have servers that are set up to basically, they have vulnerability scanners on them and they also set up FTP servers on them. So basically they'll scan for different vulnerabilities that they have and then if they find it, they'll basically send you to their FTP server. And then anything that talks at FTP server is seen becoming a faceless C2 shortly thereafter. So kind of moving into the actual faceless service. Um, so now we know the moon is the proxy botnet behind it, but now we kind of want to understand um, how exactly was faceless working and what can we do to kind of disrupt it? So when we look at how faceless works, basically it'll start with uh, somebody like you or me is kind of the end user. And then you'll either reach out to one of two things. You'll reach out to the actual faceless C2, which is a weird choice for them to have users directly contact it, but not my decision. Um, or you'll reach out to an intermediary node, which will then that intermediary node will contact, basically push the data over to the faceless C2. The C2 will then reach out to the faceless bot and then it'll go to the end target. And that way, um, the pipeline's very obfuscated, so no IP leaking would happen. Um, but what's really interesting about this pipeline is that only about 25% of the end users are coming from hosted IPs. So things like Tor, um, a VPS. So we actually think most people who are using these anonymity services are coming from their actual address. They're not trying to hide themselves, really. They think these services are extremely secure for them. We see an average of around seven to 10,000 distinct IPs uh, per week that are contacting this service. So that's likely at least several thousand different users every single week are using these tools. So um, they're very popular um, services. So uh, it's well been speculated that faceless has always catered to cybercrime, but there's never um, really been too much proof about that. So one of our goals was to try to figure out, could we see if like, does it actually cater to cybercrime outside of posting on criminal services? So when we look at, um, when we remove all the hosted IPs and the Tor IPs, we try to figure out um, who's actually connecting to this service. So the top six countries make up around 90% of users that are contacting um, this service. And we have a data bias towards the United States data, so the fact that it's only 25% is actually quite small. Then when we look at the rest of the countries that round this out, we have Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana, Russia, Turkey, all areas that um, can sometimes skew higher in cyber crime or cyber fraud related activity. So this does kind of line up with, if this was a completely benign proxy service, we would likely expect many more countries to kind of round this out. But given kind of the countries we see, this does line up that it's catering to a specific group of people and likely focus more on cyber crime and cyber fraud related activities. All right, to the fun part. Um, so we tried to disrupt the moon on August 26th. Um, we know routed the entire faceless pipeline. We know routed all of the moon infrastructure, the faceless infrastructure, all the intermediary C2s everything we could. And initially it looked like it was going really well. We had about, the service went down about 70% of the total bots had completely disappeared from the service. And then shortly thereafter, as you can see on the right side, um, the entire service went down. Um, so we were pretty excited for a little, um, but that was quite short lived. Uh, later that day, um, the entire service would come back online at full strength, um, which was quite confusing to us. Um, but when we looked at it a little more, we noticed only 30% of the original bots were now part of the faceless network. So basically that's 70% that we kicked out. They somehow supplemented a new 70% of bots within uh, I think it was 24 to 48 hours. Um, so what happened? Um, so before we no routed uh, faceless, they had an average of about 50 to 60 devices per IP that were being used. Um, and this was quite common for multiple months before our no route. 
then right when we no routed, almost immediately they jumped up to about a hundred so IPs or devices per IP. And as you can see, that number kept creeping up all the way through June to where they had about 170 devices per IP. When you get into this range of devices per IP, likely what it means is you're starting to deal with a lot of mobile devices. So a lot of mobile gateways, a lot of devices are coming through. So what most likely happens is we took out a large portion of their network and they somehow found a large either mobile botnet they had, or maybe they found a reseller and they were able to get tons of mobile IPs really quickly to basically supplement our entire effort. And as we notice in July, um, they finally uh, created a new Moon C2. So from the one we know routed, they finally made a new one. And lo and behold, their numbers started dropping immediately as they started likely getting a lot of the devices that previously we know routed, they started getting them back. Uh, so kind of, was our no route a success? Um, partially, yes, partially no. Um, so we did clearly um, remove a lot of bots from the faceless network, which was definitely a good sign. Um, the thing we really underestimated, though, is just how much of the botnet they were going to be able to refill so quickly. We um, did not expect that they'd be able to find another botnet so fast or another population. So kind of how do we improve this for next time? Um, one of the big ways is um, when we know routed them, they kept all their same architecture. Even though we took out like 70% of their network, they clearly weren't kind of phased or affected by that. So we would likely need several more partners with us who have the ability to basically cut the kind of paths for um, these bots to go through, and it would force them to change architecture, get entire new bots. Um, so that's kind of what we're hoping in the future is we can partner with a lot more entities in order to uh, do a lot more damage to these type of networks. And yeah, if there's any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Sorry, I do have a mic here, um, so I'll be running around. If you do have a question, raise your hand up high, and I will come with you on the mic. Who were you hoping to partner with you to take down the botnet? Um, yeah, so basically people who have the ability to um, disrupt internet traffic kind of at scale would be extremely helpful. So like Lumen, um, going back to going back to kind of this network map, so when we know route, we basically stop any successful communication from transiting across our wires. So other um, large ISPs or ASNs that have kind of similar networking, if we can partner with them, especially ones we do very well in the US, but especially in other countries and other areas, um, the more partners we can get, the more basically we can cut off traffic from all sorts of areas. So if we all do it together, um, we could likely take down not only this botnet, for example, but a lot larger scale ones that are even more spread out. Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, not directly. Um, obviously, we have some transit lines that like their data, like that's how we could see the users are coming from there but we don't have like specific partners located there. Do you have a contact mechanism or an intake? If somebody does want to reach out or an organization wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to be aware of your intent and try to get a hold of you if there is a front door? Over. Uh, yeah, definitely here. Um, come talk to us and we can pass our info. We would love to talk to anybody. You want. Twitter. Oh yeah, Twitter too. Um, Black Lotus, La is that our handle? It's Black Lotus. Yeah, Black Lotus Labs on Twitter, but definitely uh, anybody come talk to us if you're interested in um, yeah potential partnering or if you could help at all, um, we'd love to talk. Uh, yeah, definitely. When you saw the big spike in the uh, traffic where it was obvious that they brought in, not to say another network potentially, but they probably got it from someone else, any chance that it, where you were saying it was mobile, did you see any IoT stuff or uh, I guess other internet connected devices being used in that or if it was discernible? Yeah, so considering, so one of the hard things was um, considering we no routed them from our infrastructure and they didn't change architectures, we couldn't see, they basically got a ton of new bots outside of our network. 
Um, so basically, um, if we had other partners, obviously they could have cut that part off, but they basically were able to create a whole new botnet outside of us, mobile based. Awesome. Well, yeah. Oh. Did you uh, see any evidence that this was uh, like something automatic that was maybe horizontally scaled, similar to, to Kubernetes, like noticing more demand and just scaling up more like containers type thing? Like, is there any evidence you could see that it was something that they just had in reserves from before and they just flipped the switch when they noticed a demand? Yeah, there's a chance it could have been. Um, however, we did see them going down, and then when, when they went offline, um, clearly something happened, and then getting a whole new population. So either they already had a contact almost ready for this sort of situation, like maybe they already had that pipeline mapped out and said, hey, we're going to keep this off, but in the day we need it, we'll turn that on. That definitely could have been something along those lines. Um, yeah, it's hard to tell exactly. Um, we couldn't trace down... Um, any other proxy network that they definitely were coming from for this one. Awesome. awesome. Thank you guys so much. I'm sure they will be here and available to answer any one of the questions you have. But that is a wrap for breaking ground here, folks, on the first day of East Size Las Vegas. Thank you so much for coming out. For those of you tuning in at home, thank you so much for tuning in. We hope to see you right back here tomorrow, either in this track or another one at B-Sides. Thanks again.